Don't adjust your sound settings. We're here. We did it. We're episode 100, and you're listening to, or maybe even watching, Human Factors Cast. You don't want to miss this one, folks. We have giveaways, news, and plenty of other banter to go around. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. We got a lot to talk about today. We're talking about DARPA is pushing for AI to explain its decisions a controversial proposal about the ethics of computer science, how we can help computers perceive human errors, and uh, NIH's partnership with Google to speed up medical breakthroughs. And a little later, we're going to talk about what is a wireframe and uh, potentially what is a mock-up. We'll be, uh, we'll be back with all that, and, uh, and we're breaking it down <laughs> right after this. Human Factors Cast strives to bring you the best in human factors chatter every week. We pack news, interviews, reviews, and overall fun conversations into each and every product that we put our seal of approval on. But we can't do it without you. You see, the Human Factors Cast Network is 100% listener supported. All the funds that go into running this show come from the listeners. That's why we're giving back to our supporters on Patreon, now more than ever. Pledges start at just $1 per month and include rewards like 24-7 access to our exclusive Human Factors Cast Slack channel, personalized professional reviews, and Human Factors Cast Infinite, a Patreon-only podcast where the topic is human factors, etc. We're always updating our rewards, so stop by patreon.com slash humanfactorscast to see what support level may be right for you. Thank you all, and remember, it depends. Okay, so we're here. We're back. Blake, how are you? I'm good. I love that intro and your mom saying it depends at the very I, end. Yeah. We're, we're here. We're back. This is episode 100. We're, we're on YouTube. We man. are. There's a video camera in <laughs> front of us this there's time. There's a video camera right there. We're on YouTube. Uh, we're trying to be as professional as we can for our 100th episode. Welcome. You're here. Uh, we're breaking everything down. You heard us at the top of the show. That was our like first time ever recording a podcast. Our individual times, of course, they're kind of faded. So it's my first time on a podcast, and then it was your first time on a podcast. Uh, man, it's been a wild kind of journey. It's getting- <laughs> been a wild ride. I can't believe we're at 100 episodes, which technically we've talked about this a little bit. We're over 100. We are technically over 100 because of all of our bonus episodes and whatnot. Uh, but yeah, I just want to thank all of you because this wouldn't have been possible without our listeners here. And uh, if you're just joining us for the first time on YouTube, welcome to the show. We're glad to have you. Uh, we're going to be talking about a lot of fun stuff today, but Blake, I kind of want to reminisce really quick about our 100 episodes, and I want to talk to you about potentially what's what's like your favorite moment of, I don't know, the past uh, 100 episodes. My favorite moment's got to be episode eight, when the first one that I came on, because I was it was super nerve-wracking for me stepping into Billy's garage at that time to sit down and record an episode all about controls, talking about human factors. And I don't know, it was just one of those things where I was like, am I really dreaming that I'm actually sitting down recording a podcast for the first time? Yeah, you you were dreaming because, uh, is this real life? I don't know. I'm not really sure. <laughs> That's a whole debate for another podcast, but anyway. It's still kind of surreal. I don't know. I, uh, my favorite memory, I think, would have to be, um, you know, about, uh, I, I don't know, it had to be like 20 episodes in or something. You and I sat down and we basically said... Uh, uh, this this format's not working. The lecture series, if you will, uh, just the format didn't fit for kind of the continuous content that we wanted to provide. And so you and I sat down, we brainstormed, and we're like, if we were to listen to a Human Factors podcast, what would be the kind of content that we would want? <laughs> you know. And so we came up with the news stories, and, and it's just been – it seems like there's something every week to talk about, and some weeks are slower than others. But uh, I thought that was a really good change, and I, I'm really enjoying the direction this podcast is going and uh, and all that stuff. So here's to 100 more episodes, man. Here's to 100 more or maybe even more than 100. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> OK, so we're going to get into our normal banter here. I see you have a couple things about Home Depot. Do you want to do you want to buzz market them or what? Yeah, let's buzz market. Home okay. Depot. No. So it was a really weird experiment experience that I had, I think, yesterday or the day before. But anyway, I went in there to go get like a stud finder and like a, a I don't know, a laser level just because I needed, needed them to put stuff on the walls of the house. Okay. 
And I hadn't been to a Home Depot in a couple of years, but I walked in and there was almost like no humans to be found. It was a really surreal experience for me, like anybody that worked there anyway. So I was wandering around the aisles looking for stuff and it it turned out on every aisle there was like an ad plastered for their Home Depot app that basically helps you search and locate any items that you want. I was like, okay, that's cool. Um, and it, it worked pretty well, but it was, it was this weird disconnect between like I've walked in the store now to even find something. I have to download an app if I don't know exactly where it is. I can't really right. find a human being. So it was, it was kind of strange. But then even it, in the checkout process, like it's after I got done using their app and all that kind of stuff and like found the items I needed, even checkout was automated. It was just me scanning my own stuff and then walking out of the store. It was just kind of a... A weird experience for me. Yeah, but self checkouts. No, you're no stranger to self checkout. We talked about this on the show a couple weeks back. You, yeah, how you love it. On, Yeah, I do. I do. I really do because it like it gets you around all the crowds and that kind yeah. of stuff. But it was just really strange going into a store and trying to understand. Like, okay, it, I don't think it's too far in the future that we're going to see Home Depot just being basically, you know, maybe more surveilled by humans instead of being like run by humans themselves inside for like the the in and out daily stuff. Yeah, I, I get that. I it's. That's interesting because my experience with Home Depot is very different. Any time I go in, it's always fairly populated with people, um, or or maybe it's just the location. I don't know. Like if they're trialing something wherever you went, versus you know where I where I usually go. Which would make sense if they were, because it's kind of a it's a low traffic place. So maybe that it just made more sense for them to try it out. Um, right. But, but I definitely think there's something to be worked out in the process of like creating that kind of experience for people when they come in the store because it was it was kind of a hassle to sit there and wait for like my app to download and like go through that whole process of putting your password in right, and right. That, that kind of stuff and then just leaving the store and deleting it again again so there's got to be some kind of better way to make that, to facilitate that interaction but I just don't really know what it is or even like a web app right like the mobile site like yeah. you can do a lot of things with a mobile website Right? Yeah, and I was I, I was wondering like with stuff like AR Kit, wouldn't it just make it a little bit more even interactive as far as like right. going around the store? So maybe maybe they should move towards web apps versus this like native iOS or Android stuff. But anyway, okay, buzz marketing for <laughs> Home Depot. Uh, I got something to talk about, and and maybe you can talk about it too. But uh, I told you to download this thing called Play Night, uh, not to be confused with the popular children's game Fork Knife. Um, the popular children's game. The popular, it's popular among all the kids. We're already off to a good start with YouTube. I'm sure we're getting uh, down votes already. What, what is it? Thumbs down. Uh, <laughs> dislikes. Um, but Play Night. So this thing is really cool. This is a, uh, this is, we talked about it on the show a couple weeks ago. I was very excited to get my gaming laptop. And one thing with a gaming laptop, there's a ton of different launchers out there right now. You have like uh, Steam, you have Good Old Games, you have Origin, you have Uplay, you have Blizzard, you have a bunch of these different launchers. And what this program is, is just a, some guy um, put together a unified interface for you to be able to launch all your games from uh, fr- from the app, from Play Night. And, and basically, it's it's really cool pulls in all of your games from your Steam library, from all these different directories I told you. It's always growing, so they're going to add more of these, like uh, like potentially the Twitch service has a bunch of games on it that it'll eventually add. You have to add them all manually now. But, but the beauty of this is that you can actually just launch the games right from this thing, no matter what the... Uh, what the launcher is and it's it's really cool it integrates with things like uh like emulators so you can launch Star Fox uh right next to my blue stacks and i it's all from one interface and i love it so did you download it that's question one yeah i did i downloaded it and started playing with it a little bit and it's to be honest it's an awesome interface for something that somebody just made like home grew on their own yeah and then it's like it's very consistent and easy to use and even for the stuff that i had to do like because i have fork knife and they haven't <laughs> they haven't integrated uh, Epic's launcher into it as of yet anyhow. Yeah, yeah. And so even that process was simple to integrate it in there and make sure that I can launch it as soon as I open it. Type of stuff. Right. And and one thing you probably noticed as you were uh, as you were integrating Fork Knife, uh, you can left click on the thing and actually edit and and pull in metadata from uh, the IGDB, uh, which is the uh, Presumably, international gaming database. Some Maybe. gaming database sounds good enough to me. But you can pull in all the information, and uh, it'll populate like what genre it is, who the developer is, publisher, release date, 
tags, uh, links to their official website and Steam and even their social media channels. Uh, it, it It's really great. I love it. Except for this one I'm looking at right now is in German. <laughs> but um, Well, it's just nice because you don't have to go like digging through or save a bunch of launchers on your taskbar or anything like that. You can just launch everything from yeah. one consolidated interface. And you don't have to deal with a bunch of like you know shortcuts sitting on your desktop or whatever it may be. It's yeah, I just I just love it, and I had to give them a shout out. So if you're a, a PC gamer at all, go check out Play Night, um, and I guess Fork Knife too. Uh, yeah, if, please check out Fork Knife. <laughs> I'd love to play with anybody that listens to Human Factors Cast and hit Blake up because he apparently is really into that game. Yep. Uh, so before we move on, I want to get into a couple programming notes. Um, this first one is actually kind of cool because we've had her on the show a couple times. You may remember our uh, third usual co not usual like occasional co-host yeah we tried to keep her on the show as much as we could for yeah. a period of time there uh, i don't know i got a dot at the office i might bring her in oh goodness anyway we have uh we have some exciting news regarding um i won't say her name because we all kind of know who sh- who we're talking about here but i'll say alexander so alexander um from amazon from amazon uh, you can now ask Alexander to play the latest episode of Human Factors Cast, and we will be coming through your speakers. It's really cool. That's pretty awesome. I tried it. It's really neat. Uh, and as I mentioned, we are now on YouTube. Uh, YouTube will be put up just in a slight delay due to production video video production scheduling, um, but it should be up the following day. If you're listening to the audio version of this podcast, the feed will still remain. Uh, we're not getting rid of that. It's, it's going to be uh, just the same. But what we do ask you of you uh it would really help us out if you went and like and subscribed on youtube and give us a good start kind of you know uh i hate asking for this kind of stuff but you know the more subs we have um and the more likes we get the more likely it is that we'll be able to change our youtube slash name to uh human factors cast and and we need your support to do that so if you wouldn't mind go check that out and actually just go check out the show because i mean uh some of our patrons got to see this but uh i think it's pretty high quality we're we're providing um, you know, graphics and visuals for all of our news stories that we're talking about. Because it really turns it into like an actual news show that's being produced and put on YouTube. It's yeah. kind of, it's a little insane. Like, it's kind of surreal, right? I mean, like you and I both had that moment. I, I showed you the initial test footage uh, last week in the office and, and we both kind of just sat there and said, oh, wow, this is... Uh, it's not what I expected at all. Right, but in, in the best possible way. Yeah, 100%. So if, you, if you're wondering what we're talking about, go check us out on YouTube. Please like and subscribe. It would help us out a whole lot. Uh, and I'm, I'm not going to beg anymore. I hate doing that, but but please do help us. Um, we also have some exciting news. Man, this is episode 100. We're going balls to the wall here. This is big, man. Uh, I, I do want to bring up, we did have our AHFE bonus episode a couple weeks ago. Big thanks to Logan for helping us out with that. Um, we are uh, going to have some coverage out of HFES International in Philly this year. Um, How are we going to do that, Nick? <laughs> like, I'm so excited about this, I can hardly contain my enthusiasm here. But uh, look, we, we announced it in our Slack a couple weeks ago. But we are actually uh, going to be in a partnership with... HFES. So what does that mean? So HFES is going to actually hook us up with a booth right by registration. So you can stop by and say hello um, and, uh, you know, come hang out with us. Please do. I mean, if if anybody's going to HFES this year, please come stop by the Human Factors Cast booth or any of the various programming things we'll do while we're there. Yeah, so it sounds like uh, we still haven't ironed out the full schedule, but we're we're going to be out there podcasting at least twice a day. It seems like, um, including Ergo X. So we'll have some coverage from Ergo X, um, and uh, you know, as part of our partnership with HFES, they're asking us to reach out to you guys, our listeners, to see if there's any sort of notable figures or speakers in the human factors world that you would like to hear on the show. If they're going to HFES, we'll we'll gladly reach out to HFES the organization and see if we can get them on the show to interview them. Um, We do have a lot lined up. Uh, It sounds like we may interview some of the past, present, future president elect uh, of HFES. Um, A couple of the keynote speakers potentially. So it's, it's a pretty big deal and I'm pretty excited to announce this partnership. It's really exciting. Yeah. It's going to be a lot of awesome content to come out 
definitely throughout that one week, but I Oof. mean, up until and afterwards will be the same type of stuff too. So look forward to the, uh, everything that's going to come out of HFES and us working together with them. Yeah, honestly, and and that week is going to be super packed for content. It kind of gives me anxiety just thinking about all of the different interviews that we have to package and send out. Um, but hopefully, we're able to provide that to you guys on all the platforms we're available on, and. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll be there. We'll, we'll be hanging out. We'll have a live booth set up. So if you want to hear, listen to Human Factors Cast live, we'll just we'll be out there out by registration with our speakers and uh, with our interviewees. And uh, Human Factors Cast live from Philly. Here we go. Yeah. Here's uh, a really exciting thing to me. Um, you know, uh, I mentioned that we have some surprises along the way. This is episode 100. As we, if we haven't had enough already. I know. Yes. We, we, surprise after surprise. Uh I want to announce a giveaway. So last time we did a giveaway, it was like a test giveaway for our shirt. Uh, and uh, stop laughing. <laughs> it was a shirt, okay? And, and then so, so this time, we want to give away something a little bit more valuable. Uh, we know a lot of you listening to the show are uh, potentially students or uh, are obviously interested in, in human factors. And, and one good opportunity that Blake and I continuously bring up on the show is being able to go to these conferences, it's a pretty big deal because you make connections, you network with people that potentially could get you jobs in the future or or uh, you know provide you with research that you need later on. I don't know. The you important, can, Yeah, I mean, you can even do like mock interviews too, which yeah. helps you a lot in like getting ready to get a job if, you, if you're like still in school or just meeting people in general that way too. Yeah, these, long story short, these conferences are a big deal. So what are we giving away? Blake? I'm going to let you do the honors because I've been spilling the beans on everything else. Oh, my goodness. He's going to let me do it. All right. So we are giving away free registration to this year's annual meeting in Philadelphia. And, and yeah. And I just want to jump in here. If you want to figure out how to enter that contest, stay tuned till the end of the episode. Um, that's that's a nice little tease, I think. Got him. I got him. <laughs> I got him. See what we did there? We hooked you. Now you got to listen to the whole episode or skip ahead. I don't care. Don't tell but him that. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> you know what? I don't care. <laughs> if you listen to the episode and you don't listen if you listen just for the entry criteria then whatever. <laughs> I don't That's your own prerogative. They've It'll already right. they've already listened to a couple minutes of it. There were we're like 20 minutes in already. <laughs> Okay, uh, and then we also have HFES Australia coming to Perth, and we do have coverage from that. So, uh, with all that said, you know what time it is. It's time to get the news. That's right, Blake. This is the part of the show where we talk about human factors news. This is everything related to the field of human factors. This could be anything from medical, transportation, psychology, you name it. As long as it uh, deals with the field of human factors, it is fair game. Blake, what do we got up first this week? <laughs> All right, this week we're talking a little bit about DARPA and what they're doing for AI. So companies like to flaunt their use of artificial intelligence to the point where it virt it's virtually meaningless. But the truth is that AI, as we know it, is still quite dumb. While it, it can generate useful results, it really can't explain why it produced res those results in meaningful terms or adapt to the ever-evolving situations. DARPA thinks that it can move AI forward, though. It's launching a new artificial intelligence exploration program that will invest a, in new AI concepts, including third-wave AI that's contextual adaption and, and, and an ability to explain its decisions in a way that makes sense. So, for example, if it identified a cat, it would explain that it detected fur, paws, and whiskers in a familiar shape as a cat would. So, importantly, DARPA hopes that it that to step up the pace of AI's development and it's promising a streamlined process that will lead projects to a start starting three months after a funding opportunity shows up with feasibility becoming clear about 18 months after a team wins an actual contract, which we know can take a long time once you want what you actually want a contract to be able to, you know, start building and churning on it. But Nick, what do you think about kind of this DARPA jun jumping into the AI race right now? I think this is incredibly necessary. Um, I think one of the missing pieces from sort of the the human AI relationship that we have now is this whole missing link between you know what the artificial intelligence system uh, came up with and how it came up with that thing. And this is proving or not proving. This is this is hoping to answer that question by providing the human actual input as to what factors went into that assessment. 
Yeah, and I think that's that's the only way that we're really going to get any kind of AI that humans can really interact with and make interventions to. Because I mean, if you're if you're having something detect it, if it's detecting something that looks like a cat, for instance, I mean, you could even apply this to driving autonomous vehicles. Like if it's detecting some kind of maneuver that it needs to make, but why is it actually making it? How is an operator supposed to get enough SA to kind of you know jump in there and make any kind of difference? Whereas now AI, and also too, I think it's great that DARPA's hopping in to really try and drive a direction for AI. Because right now, as they kind of like make the point in the article. A lot of times we're using like the term AI or machine learning in in results that don't really warrant it, or it's just like a buzzword that's being used about new technology. Yeah, I I really like the um, the graphics that go with this. I'm, I'm trying to tease our listeners to go to YouTube and check this out because uh, you can actually see like it, it says it has fur, whiskers, and it has this feature, and it shows a picture of the cat's ears, right? So it it visually shows you what aspects of the thing it's picking up on. And uh, I mean, I, I think about this in the context of like a self-driving vehicle where, you know, uh, potentially a system on the dashboard says, I see red lights, which means I'm not going to go uh, or, or I'm slowing down, right? Um, it's, it's able to sort of translate these things where if potentially the human is out of the loop in the driver's seat, uh, it'd be very easy for them to kind of just tune in to this sort of uh, situation awareness screen, if you will, that will let them know what the machine is thinking at that time. And I don't know. I just, I just think this is the missing link that we are missing from uh, our relationship with AI at this point. Yeah, and I think there's a lot, there's so much movement forward from other tech companies like Google and like Amazon that are just like, they're just speeding forward without kind of trying to figure out the smaller inter- intermediary parts, like what it, right. what a readout needs to look like to somebody if they have to understand what's going on from an AI's decision point or decision-making standpoint. And like a, an organization like DARPA, it makes a lot more sense for them to be kind of jumping in and trying to figure out how you're going to actually integrate the human into this because i mean they do a lot of military contracts and some other some other kind of very intensive things where they're going to have to put humans in the loop so i think it's just good to see I'll, i'm interested to see how they're going to try and either catch up or stay in line with what's going on in the innovations in just the tech world in general because I, th- I think that they'll have to stay in some kind of lockstep with them or else they'll just get surpassed and maybe what they're developing won't actually you know potentially show what's actually going on in the world you're saying that if ai gets so advanced that it's making all these different decisions that that this system where it has to explain it won't won't catch up is that that's kind of like my assumption okay i mean i i don't know it depends on how they build it right because if they build it in such a way that is um adaptive to whatever the system is uh producing then i think it's it's totally uh expandable and and um scalable that's the word i'm looking for scalable (laughs) yeah and i think that maybe that's like an important design aspect for them to consider is it scalable as models change for what's sitting under the ai systems i would imagine it would have to be uh to to go forward with something like this because they wouldn't just design um with the present in mind they'd be designing i would hope with you know the future of the field of artificial intelligence in mind and uh you know, it all it all comes back. We we talk about AI so much on the show, and it all comes back to sort of how the human is informed, and is this type of information going to be effective for it to understand what the AI is determining? Yeah, and I think it might even help. You know, kind of just with model development in general, understanding what decisions are being made based off of, like in the cat example, based off of the ear in this case. Well, what if it was making a determination of a cat that was wrong? You would know why it's making a wrong decision or what it was using that caused it to make a wrong decision. Um, so at the end of the day, it's it's good to see. I like. I can't wait to like hear more about how it keeps going. Yeah, me too. All right. Well, why don't we get into our next story here? All right, this one's pretty interesting. So in the midst of growing concern over artificial intelligence, privacy, and use of data, Brett Hench has a controversial proposal. The computer science community should change its peer review process to ensure that researchers disclose any possible negative societal consequences of their work in papers or risk rejection. Without such measures, Hetch thinks that computer scientists will blindly develop products without considering their impacts, and the field risks joining the oil and tobacco industries as whose researchers history judges unfavorably. So the ACM, the Association for 
Computing Machinery, the world's largest computing society, is making changes to encourage researchers to consider societal impacts with some new guidelines. These guidelines call for researchers to be alert to how their work can influence society and take steps to protect privacy and continually reassess technologies whose impact will change over time, such as those based in machine learning. So, Nick, this is an interesting conversation that we actually had with Woodrow, who had yeah. been to Kai this year. Yes. And he, I think that, I'm not sure if he heard this out of Kai or not, but regardless, he was kind of aware of this idea of when we end when we papers, we kind of only think about the positive or what's the, the future implications. Right. But we're rarely ever talking about, like, well, what's the negative consequence here? Right. How does this negatively impact society or the individual person who's using this technology, right? Um, this is interesting for a variety of reasons because it seems like just one of those no duh things. Like it, it, it feels like it should already be included in scientific papers. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's weird that it's not because we think we think we talk about limitations of studies. Right. We talk about like what the what this could be applied to in the future, and you would think from stemming from there, it might be we would have already thought about like putting well, it could have this negative impact here or there. Sure. But at the same time. There, I don't know any other way to put this. There's kind of a game being played where you continuously want to get your research funded, yeah. And you're going, you want to be going in a positive direction. Yeah, that's one uh, problem with it. It's it's politics, right? When it comes to research, it's all politics. It's all about getting funded so that you can do the next big thing. And uh, right now, we don't have any of these standards because one reason or another, it's just not there. And and if we did have these types of things, then then perhaps. Maybe lines of research would be cut short, sure, but I feel like in the long run it could be more uh, beneficial to society, right? Yeah, I think I think right now part of the problem too is is when we're dealing with AI and machine learning, it's just it's so exciting to see what you can do with it and what the applications potentially are, and from a computer science perspective, what can be done computationally so fast yeah. and so quickly without really worrying about like what what's coming later. Yeah, one thing that's actually fascinating to me is that it's it's almost like a another separate mind experiment and traditionally i mean sometimes you do get like here are the negative impacts of this technology of this research of whatever it is sometimes you get that but it's its own separate paper and what this would do is force the researchers to think critically about their research uh in a way that they're not being challenged now or maybe they are but they're just not expressing it so this would basically force researchers to go okay, what negative implications do we have? And it would further make an interesting discussion once that paper goes to peer review and somebody else comes back and calls you out on, on something that potentially you didn't see. And it would, it would just make for, I mean, obviously there are nasty people out there who will chew your stuff up and spit you out. But like, honestly, I, yeah. I like the discourse between, uh, you know, sort of how important or devastating something could be to societal uh, values. Like, yeah, that's and super I, exciting. Well, I think the other thing too, that's important. I mean, even if, because they, they, there's a little bit more that talks about this process throughout this uh, article, because it's, it's actually an interview with Brent Hench, who's like push, pushing this forward and how it kind of works. But I think one thing that's super important here is that even if something is, has negative consequences that the papers still get published, regardless of like whether people start people i guess in some kind of committee decide whether you can still continue in that line of research i think knowing and understanding the negative consequences is just as important as like a peer-reviewed group of people like rejecting a paper because of them i think it's important for the public to understand or at least scientists in general to be able to read what's going on in ai what are the negative consequences vr same thing i mean right. any, any kind of line of research yeah um so he asks a couple questions here. Do we want to go through these and just kind of tackle them one by one? Yeah, I kind of bolded a couple of them that I thought might be really important to talk about. All right, let's talk about them. Um, so one one question was that, so if you if you submit, submit a publication, do you reject a paper if the research has protect, potentially negative impacts? And this is a little bit what I was trying to get at. I mean, his response is that no, they're not saying that you should be rejecting a paper with extensive negative impacts. It's just all those negative impacts, they just need to be disclosed so that like, in, they're out there in public domain and people can understand the implications of, this, of the technology that's being developed. Sure, and I kind of equate this to the, um, the not significant uh, research argument. I, I, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but 
oftentimes researchers won't publish things that are non-significant, right? Yeah. Statistically st- significant, right? It could be meaningful, but not significant. And, and, um, it's just a phrasing of hypotheses. And I don't understand why there's such an emphasis on this 95%. It's all arbitrary. Um, and, and to me, a paper should be publish publishable if you found something uh, up or down, right? If, if something is there, yes or no. Uh, and that way, when people go to search through all the research that's been done, they can say, oh, this thing has already been done and they found nothing. Like, I don't know. And I, I feel like this is kind of similar to that in the sense where if you only publish things that are positive to society and you don't publish things that are negative to society, then uh, people would be doing the same research in this infinite loop, not knowing that somebody else has already done that. Uh, and they're just trying to find something positive. And I think that's what this article is kind of getting at is that we're stuck in that loop. Now we're always saying positive things, but what is the negative impact and how can we use that to inform other research? Yeah. And I think that's, that's something that I definitely agree with. I see, I see that like we get stuck in that recursive loop of it's either that or like we you try and find something positive that came out in a small effect size right right um so it's i don't know i i think this is a good idea that they do mention within the same question that it will become tougher for people that are like trying to get their research funded further because i mean it's going to have negative impacts if, i mean if your study has negative impacts it can possibly have negative impacts on anybody wanting to fund it further right i mean it depends on how negative too right the, yeah, how, and th- I think that requ- that almost requires more research in yeah. itself. Like you, you come up with some sort of negative prediction based on what you found, and then it's like going down that rabbit hole. Is this really true, or does it stop right. at some point? Yeah. Um, so it, it leads. I think it leads to ultimately more opportunities to continue to understand the problem you're trying to solve, like in a holistic kind of sense, both positive, negative, and in the middle. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, let's get into this next question. Uh, how can computer scientists go about predicting possible negative? So how can they do it? Yeah, this is really important, and I think it it branches outside of computer science. I'm not sure if the answer is only specific here. So I'm just going to kind of read through the general, sure. general deal. So computer science has been sloppy about how it understands and communicates the impacts of, the, of its work because we haven't been trained we as in scientists have been trained to think about these kinds of things. It's like a medical study says, look, we cured a thousand people, but it doesn't mention that it caused a new disease in 500 of them. That's, that's another kind of important point there is like, how do you even start to determine these like tangential things that happen based off of your science? Right. But anyway, keeping going. So social scientists can really advance our understanding of how innovations impact the world, and we're going to need to engage with them to execute our proposal. So execute this idea of bringing in these negative consequences of the technology you're researching. Uh, so there are some difficult cases to consider, for instance, in, a theory, in theory papers that are, far more, that are far from practice. That makes a lot of sense. And we need to be, need to be saying, based on existing evidence, that this is... That the confidence that a given innovation <laughs> will have a side effect, that's hard That's hard to even determine. And if it's above a certain threshold, we need to talk about it. So this, this says a lot of different things, mainly that you have to be critical about what anything actually, what studies are really showing you. So you have to figure out these tangential problems that might be coming up. But also, too, it's going to require not only like a department like computer science uh, completing a paper, but then or completing a line of research or coming up with hypotheses to study, but also then interacting with different departments to try and really figure out what consequences all this could have. Yeah, and, and even the threshold piece, that that's interesting too, right? Because if it's significant or not significant or positive or negative, how much and, and what is the threshold? What is Because, I mean, we've set, like I said, this arbitrary threshold of 95% uh, for statistical significance, and what is the threshold for... Um, I guess meaningfulness with with respect to its impact to society. Yeah, that's a that's a harder question to answer. Too. Asking the heavy hitting questions. <laughs> yeah, the philosophical <laughs> questions. The the part that I do worry about in this in this instance is it it's going to prolong the process, and also it's going to require more people to have to be a part of you know the proposal writing process. So it's going to re- require a lot of you know cross departmental. Working, which sometimes in university is not that easy to do. Right. Yeah. And I mean, it even the last question here even brings up private technologies and how do you 
sort of address the research that's being done in these private companies and how will you reach them and, and get their assessment on whether or not it's beneficial to society. Yeah, and in this... Or negative to society. The, in the private technology companies bit, it's something that I don't know how to make heads or tails of because Google, in some regards, is really good about publishing the research that they do to a, to a point. And so is Disney as well. Uh, they, I mean, we've talked about a, a bunch of their stories that come out of their research firms, but what about the stuff that doesn't make it to the public? Or like the, the research that pot- potentially may be resulting in negative consequences that they don't talk about. Um, so I, I feel like there's, for this question, I don't know how you're going to really bridge that gap because there's there's a lot of legality and things going on with like, you know, protecting their business as well. Right. But yeah. I mean, the, the, I feel like there's a social obligation to disclose anything that may have negative impacts. Yeah. It, I think that gets tricky though, because how do you how do we define negative impacts for society acro- like across society, and then what does that really mean per company or per company that has like a Skunk Works program like Facebook or Google? I'm starting to see why this is controversial. Oh, definitely. Yeah, I think I, uh, I think it makes more sense in academia. Uh, but if you're absolutely. trying to get into these these private companies, it's gonna be much much harder. Yeah, I I, I just yeah, because I mean like that. I'm sure Facebook, like if Facebook had to disclose, you know, <laughs> what metrics they tweaked to get more people to stay on their platform longer, uh, some may consider that, you know, not not necessarily uh, a societal benefit. <laughs> yeah, and you know, th- that's the part that I struggle with, though, because it's definitely adverse to society. I'm sure there right. there's some like almost dopamine gaining effect from yes. like interacting with Facebook, but I, as a scientist. I would rather know and be able to understand and see how that technology is impacting people in this way and what is what's being done to be to allow that to happen. Is there yeah. any way we can start combating it? Yeah, and I, I bet you uh, that this is going to fall down on the side of, well, if it's detrimental to society and detrimental to business, then they don't have to report it. Like, if it's detrimental to their business, I, I have a feeling yeah. the government will side with that aspect of it, right? Even if it is detrimental to society... If that means it'll be detrimental for business, then they're they're not going to disclose. They're not going to have be required to disclose anything. Yeah, I, d- I actually don't really know because, and I'm I, I know I'm speculating a lot here, but it's it's one of these things where I feel like, especially when, you, when if anybody watched the trial footage uh, while Zuckerberg was on trial, I feel like our government is really just not sure yet how to deal with some of these tech companies and no. what and what to do. They're really not. They're yeah. clueless. Th- yeah, they are. It, it, or at least that's. That's the feeling that I get. So I, I think there's going to be a giant learning curve. And as time goes on, hopefully we'll be putting people in that are that are younger or have more experience with technology. But that, that wave is going to take a long time. Yeah. So I, I don't know. Okay. Well, but anyway, <laughs> let's move on. I just want to thank all of our friends over at Nature, MIT, NextGov, and Engadget for all of our news stories this week. If you want to follow along as we post these articles, you can follow us all over social media or join our Slack channel for links to the original articles. All right, Blake, we got two more up this week. What do we got up next? Let's go. Okay. So, MIT Media Lab researchers have developed a machine learning model that takes computers a step closer to interpreting our emotions as naturally as humans do. So a challenge in the field of effective computing is that people express emotions quite differently, depending on many factors. While general differences can be seen among cultures, genders, and age groups, other differences are even more fine-grained. So depending on the time of day, how much you've slept that night, or even your your level of familiarity with a conversation partner leads to subtle variations in the way you express, say, happiness or even sadness in the moment. The Media Lab researchers have developed a machine learning model that actually outperforms traditional systems in capturing these small facial expression variations to better gauge mood while training on thousands of images of faces. Moreover, by using a little extra training, the, the model can be adapted to an entirely new group of people with the same, same level of ep- efficacy. The aim is to improve existing effective computing technologies over and above what they are now. So, Nick, this is... This is kind of related to, or I'm going to relate it to what we talked a little bit about in the beginning with DARPA. Sure. So this this is helping create models that are a little bit more robust, a little bit more, that can do just that little extra in terms of trying to identify our emotions. Right. I mean, 
human emotions are something that uh, we we always talk about the non nonverbal cues between humans, right? If I'm saying something and I have a little twitch in my eye, you might be able to think maybe I'm lying or or something. I don't know, but but nonverbal communication is such an important part of how we talk to each other. And one thing that this kind of promises to me or I guess is in the right sort of vein of research for me is the ability to interact with computers in such a way that they will understand your emotions and your intent, right? If I say, Alexa, play some music, and I have a mopey face on, maybe she'll want to play something upbeat and happy. Or maybe if she understands that I don't like upbeat and happy music when I have a moody face, she'll play something less... I said the name. Some, I just realized. Oh, good, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. You know, maybe she'll play something less happy if she knows that that's what i want but how does she know well amazon's putting uh video cameras in your house now so there's there's a machine that can be able to detect it but you know it's it's these micro expressions that i feel like is missing is the missing piece i keep talking about the missing links tonight but i feel like that's another missing piece from when you communicate with a a a machine right it can't sense your frustration when you've said take me home, take me home, take me home five times, and the system doesn't do it um, because the music's too loud or the air conditioning is blowing on the microphone or whatever it is, right, when you're in your car. Uh, speaking from experience, <laughs> 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 take me home, personally take charged. me home, take me home. Uh, yeah, it's bad. Uh, I got I got a video of myself doing that because it's, it's hilarious but also really frustrating at the same time. But if the system... Um, could understand that I was frustrated, then maybe it would uh, provide some other suggestions. I don't know. I just feel like it's another piece of information that machines can use to pick up on our intent when it comes to using systems. Yeah, and it, the article talks a little bit about about like more personalized uh, experiences when it comes to effective computing. And I think your example with, uh, what was it, with elect. Uh, with Alexander, and, yeah, with Alexander, uh, knowing what kind of what music choice to make based on your facial expression, and I think that's that's something you could even learn over time too. Like right. if you have a moody face, like and it plays something upbeat, and you change it, maybe over time it starts to realize like okay, that Nick would rather have something that's more to his mood based off what I'm seeing off of his right. face or cues from your body or whatever it may be, and the fact that. They're already able to expand the mo basically expand the model by using giving the system a lot more data. I know it's a crude way to say it, um, but allowing this to kind of expand and understand maybe from different cultures, what does it mean for different facial expressions or facial or even like body language, and then same thing with genders and different age groups. Because yeah. I feel like across all of those, especially when you're talking about like an aging population, it gets a little bit more difficult to read their expressions and you'd have to be in that environment learning from them constantly. Yeah, I agree. I have nothing else to say about this. Oh, Good splendid. job. Blended. All Do right. You? <laughs> no, it, it, the, th you know, the thing that blew me the most away about this article, and maybe this, maybe I shouldn't say this, maybe it shows you how, uh, out of it I am but I'd never heard of the term effective computing Blake we talk about this stuff every week yes we talk about it every week I'm positive we talked about effective computing yeah. on the show before <laughs> no I just I just thought it was an interesting way to phrase what they're trying to do it's okay we can revisit concepts we're 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 not claiming to be experts on these topics oh uh, definitely not I did yeah. not work for MIT in any capacity no no all right we got we got one more story let's talk about it yes let's do it all right so NIH on last Tuesday, kicked off the Science and Technology Research Infrastructure for Discovery, Experimentation, and Sustainability Initiative, which establishes new partnerships aimed at bringing researchers advanced cloud services and tools to speed up biomedical innovation. The NIH offers officials selected Google Cloud as its first industry partner. The thought being that with Google's high-powered analytics tools, the program will reduce the time and cost it takes to crunch massive biomedical data sets, which could ultimately lead to teams making more medical breakthroughs more often. The program will initially focus on making high-level, high-value data sets accessible through the cloud and adopting data-centric machine learning and AI applications. The initiative aims to maximize the number of researchers working to provide the greatest number of solutions to advancing health and reducing the burden of disease. Now, that was an absolute mouthful, but at the end of the day, 
I think it's a great thing to see the NIH really pushing forward and using some of the more high power tools that Google has to provide to, you know, try and start making more biomedical breakthroughs. Yeah, I agree. I think the more technology we can utilize to sort of, um, you know, make these breakthroughs happen, I, th- I think it's it's good. I don't know what else to say. Like, honestly, it's good. It's good. Use the platforms that are at your disposal because uh, I, I don't know how overstepping I am here, but at least working in the confines of, you know, being a contractor for the government, there are a lot of really powerful commercial applications that you can't use because of security concerns, because of uh, a variety of different integration concerns and data concerns. So I'm, I'm all for using powerful platforms. Yeah, and I think, especially for Google, I mean, I know they have a lot of powerful technology that, yeah, like in government contracting, you just can't always use. So I'm glad the NIH is kind of moving forward because even for them, this is they're, they're kind of a powerful entity that has to deal with a lot of personal data. But in order to kind of crunch the numbers without having to develop your own enterprise systems or buy a system that maybe doesn't even work as well, I think this was a good choice on their part to stru- to just start trying to, one, make those all these data sets that we have accessible across cloud computing software so that different people can be working on different problems simultaneously. But also at the same time that they're they're trying out like a trying out and trusting like a real industry standard partner. Yeah. Uh I love it. I, lo- I I honestly, what else is there to say? This is excellent. What does this mean for human factors? Honestly, this for human factors, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but what I what I kind of take from it is that we'll have a, an opportunity to solve more problems. And in, in the what I'm meaning is, I mean, right now all this is doing is taking really complex data and crunching it down. Right. But this will allow you to really understand trend data a lot quicker if you're working in the medical field and you're also not having to necessarily rely on just a data scientist to help you kind of come up with your correct hypotheses for things you want to test and that kind of stuff. Well, that's the human factors application right there. It's paring down the data to be more easily digestible by the human. Yeah, sure enough. Boom, we did it. Woo! Okay, that's it for the news stories today. You know what time it is, Blake? What time is it, Nick? It came from... It came from... That's right, it came from Reddit. This is the part of the show where we search all over Reddit to bring you topics the community is talking about. So any subreddit's fair game, as long as it relates to the field of human factors, it uh, it's, it's all good. So... Blake, this week I want to talk about a topic that I have had a conversation with several other coworkers about, but I want to get your thoughts and opinions on this. This one is from the user experience subreddit by Techie Ninja, and they just go on to write, well, what is a wireframe? And in fact, I want to elaborate on this just a little bit. What is a wireframe, but what also constitutes a mock-up? What constitutes oh, a design? What constitutes So there's like Varying degrees of these things, right? How yeah. do you how do you sort of come down on the line um, for for what constitutes a, a wireframe, what constitutes a mockup, what constitutes a design? Yikes! Is, I, I, yeah, that's a lot to digest. But it, okay, let's start with the wireframe problem. Uh, so, what is a wireframe? And to me, there. Okay, so to me, there's kind of a line that blurs here a little bit between like what it, what you sketch out. Because that's technically, in in terms of how I consider and what I actually, in the process that I use, is I'll be sketching out an initial workflow of how an application might work. Sure. Or a website might be laid out. And then I usually translate that or a couple iterations that I've gone through sketching into wireframes. Now, when we say wireframe, what the hell does that even mean? Right. That's what like, I'm asking. Yeah. I feel like a lot of different <laughs> people will tell you, di- tell you something different depending on who you ask. But for me, that is like, there's no color. There's limited like content that's being put in there it's basically just a wired out frame of a website or a an application where it's it's not really getting at what are the specific design aspects it's really laying out this what's the intended workflow here and does it really does it really work for you know the high level user goals that you have sure okay so i guess my question is more along the lines of do you like let's say you were trying to capture metrics of how many mockups, how many wireframes you've done? Yeah. Would you consider uh just a simple modal a wireframe? Um I guess it would depend on like the fidelity that you did it at. 
Right. Well, it's a wireframe. Because I would so, yeah, I mean, I'd just say it's a wireframe. Yeah. yeah. So 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 would you consider that that modal dialogue just just one wireframe? Or would you let's say that modal dialogue was overlaying a greater uh, a, a greater UI, right? Like some yeah. sort of let's say just some some sort of dashboard, and you have a modal pop up. Mm-hmm. Is that two wireframes, one overlaid with the other, or is it just one? So the way that I lay out my wireframes, right, is I go just like screen by screen depending on what kind of interactions I'm expecting. Right. And so I, I would call one wireframe one screen. One screen. One screen. So if, like, okay. if I, if, let's say on the dashboard, I clicked whatever that made this modal come up, that modal being like the next screen you would see, that would be just like two wireframes. So, so you have one screen, which is just the regular screen, and then one screen overlaid with the with the with the modal, and that's two. Yeah, that would be two to me. Okay, all right. Because I mean, that's it's like you're not just designing one screen at this point; you're designing like a secondary interaction, right? So, what does it do when I have a modal pop up, or what does it do when I click this icon, right. or whatever? Yeah. Okay. So let me let me break this down a little bit more. Okay. Same. I, I would imagine you're you're your rationale is the same for mock-ups, right? If it, mock-ups, we can both agree that it's just wireframes in a little bit higher fidelity or close to perfect fidelity. Yeah, it gets... When I when you call something a mock-up, I feel like it is something that's higher fidelity. Right. So let me ask you this question. What happens if you do uh, an interface with um, a modal and perhaps a drop-down in that modal? Now you have three separate screens. Is that three separate wireframes or is it two wireframes because you're just showing the same thing on the the modal just with a drop down yeah personally i would call it three because i mean if, unless you are like i don't know i'm not i'm not really sure the need to write out the number of wireframes that you've done usually it's just like if you you make whatever you need to convey yes, the interaction i get that but what if somebody high up was saying hey how many how many designs have you provided how many how many mock-ups have you done how many wireframes like just just give me a uh, ballpark figure. Honestly, I would count the screens that I've created. So every and single if you needed to like get a little, if you needed more detail on like metric stuff, or you needed your metrics to look a little bit better, how many interactions have you created? Because hmm. you could go one level deeper there. Right. Yeah. I mean, how many interaction notes have you provided? That's a metric too. Yeah. It's bo- oh, how meaningful is that really? But then again, I I understand where you're coming from. But I mean, I mean, who cares if it's meaningful or not? People are asking for it and. It's meaningful in the sense that you can quantify the amount of work that you're doing. I guess. I mean, I just it doesn't sound like it. I mean, what does that really tell anybody that you've spent the money like in the right way, providing them <laughs> enough mock or enough wireframes? Uh, yeah. I mean, it, it shows that you're doing work. I think that's the important thing. At least you know, from my experience, it's it's been very much. Well, what have you done for us lately? And uh, we can point to that number and say, hey, look. You know, two months ago, it was uh, 20 mock-ups or UIs less. And uh, now it's 20 more. So we've done 20 in this last month. Is that a good thing? I don't know. Because That's, what if you that's go a whole other philosophical question. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't really see the need for the quantification or what that's telling you. More uh, Unless you just have more design where to do one month versus another. Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's tricky. It's tricky. But I, I like your answer. I'm going to stick with your answer because to me it, it got there was a little bit of gray area and I'm not really uh, a designer per se. And I know uh, you're a human factors practitioner and, and but you have a design bend. And mm-hmm. so that's why I wanted your opinion on this. Sure. Yeah. So we kind of hijacked uh, Techie Ninja's question, uh, but they posted a Quora article. If you have your own answer, you can go and re- reply to that Reddit thread before we leave uh, for the day. I just want to say one more thing. So, Blake. We said at the top of the show, if you're interested in winning this admission to uh, the annual conference in uh, Philadelphia this year, they have to do something. They had to make it to the end of the episode. They had to make it to the end of the episode. We're here. So to enter this contest, all you have to do is tweet at HFactors Podcast and at HFES with the hashtag HFCast and say what you are most excited for at HFES this year. That's all you got to do. Once again, you tweet at H Factors Podcast, you tweet at HFES, both of us with the hashtag HFCast, and tell us what you are most excited for. It could be a plenary speaker, keynote speaker, whatever it is, meeting, networking, meeting us, the the host and co-host of Human Factors Cast at, at HFES, whatever it is, tweet it out. And then, uh, you know what? That's it for the day. We're done. Maybe, if the sound will go. 
sometime. Still there we go. Hey, the still have some problems with the soundboard. Episode 100, we still haven't figured out the soundboard issue. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> so, enter that contest. That's it for today, everyone. Let us know what you think of the stories this week. If you're a Patreon supporter, please stay tuned for the after show. We're bringing you some good content tonight. For the rest of you, you can join the discussion on our Slack or follow us all over social media. We're on LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter at HFactors Podcast. Drop us a comment on our SoundCloud or leave us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. Starting today, you can find us on YouTube at YouTube slash a bunch of characters that won't make any sense until you like and subscribe so we can make it slash Human Factors Cast. You can also leave us a voicemail at 901-646-1432. That's 901-646-1HFC. Be sure to like, subscribe, review us on Apple Podcasts, the Google Play Store, or your favorite podcast directory. And if you want to join the after show party, you can support us on our Patreon at Patreon dot com slash human factors cast and of course you can always reach us at our home on the web humanfactorscast.com i want to thank my favorite co-host for being on the show today mr blake arnsdorf where can our listeners go and find you if they want to talk about the implications of ai in uh medicine <laughs> you guys can always find me at don't panic ux across social media including twitter and instagram as for me i've been your host nick rome you can find me across social media at nick underscore rome thanks again guys for tuning in the human factors cast until next time it, it depends! depends.